Um, yeah, thanks for the reminder. Um, anyways, yeah, so Portal has been crashing a lot and we don't know why because it's been, it's was built in 2014. So none of us know how to work it. So um, you're gonna be experiencing a lot of crashes um, in the coming days. There are gonna, I think there's two reasons why it's happening. One, the first one's kind of unlikely. Don't submit anything beyond uh, the stuff, the starter files we give you, unless you're like adding images or something. It's possible someone may have submitted a corrupt file on accident and it's affecting our backend, but that's very unlikely. Uh, but just be careful with that. Don't submit anything that we don't give you. Um, the second reason could be that everyone's just getting on at the last minute and like we're just getting overloaded with uh, users going on at once and submitting at the same time, which is very likely because um, there is a setting in our backend that sets like how many can be going on our site at, at a single time. Um, so this is just a reminder, just don't do homework or projects or labs last minute, because as you can tell, we've broken our portal like six times already in the last 24 hours. So um, we appreciate your patience while we're trying to fix this. We're all learning too. Um, and it just so happens that all of us have midterms this week. So it's just not a good time for this, um, but yeah. Hopefully this, it's gonna be okay. Um, and then this Thursday, because we have midterms or a lot of staff have midterms, if you're in Bianca, mine, Asia, Julia, or Jay's section, um, please go to someone else's lab this week. We all have midterms, um, so we are unable to hold lab. Um, and as for the midterm project, that's due Tuesday, next Tuesday. So that's right around the corner in a week um, at midnight. And you have to submit both on portal and the Google form in that link. If you don't submit in one of them, it might be considered late. I know I've noticed some of you have already submitted through the portal, but you haven't submitted on the form. So please do that. Um, and again, don't do this last minute because the portal might break. And I'm really doubtful that it's going to stay um, stay strong during Monday, Tuesday time next week. Um, but yeah, that's all the announcement for today. So Julia, take it away. Okay, so um, I'm Julia. I'm going to be teaching today's lecture on CSS animations. Um, so basically, with animations, we can create really nice dynamic websites. Um, so far, uh, what you guys have learned for CSS is, you know, styling your fonts, making different colors for your like div containers and stuff like that, using Flexbox layouts, positioning um, all of those different components on your website. But I think animations kind of like take it a step further in that it kind of provides like a better user experience. Um, a lot of times, like when you see animations on a website, it's, you know, when you're like scrolling through a website and you see, you know, different like text and images like pop up like one after another. Um, similar to like the example that you see on the left side of the slide right now. Like for example, when you scroll down, you can see that there's like columns of text that kind of like swipe up. Um, there's like moving shapes in the background and there's like profile pictures that kind of like pop up while you're scrolling. And so all of these different like ways you can incorporate animations um, kind of enhance your website in terms of like, it makes the user feel more as if they're in control a little bit. Like when they scroll to a certain point on the page, something like happens. And so like with animations, you can really take advantage of making your website more dynamic. Uh, I guess kind of reason for why a lot of people use animations is that they utilize it to effectively express their brands or identities in a very unique way. Um, so as you can see on the left side here, there is a very, um, I would say like abstract kind of like website. Um, you see there's like tigers in the background. There's a lot of like orange, like really bright orange, navy yellow colors that are popping up. Um, and it kind of just gives off like a very like artsy kind of like abstract feel. Um, and so you can use animations for different, I guess, functions, um, depending on what kind of like brand or identity you want to like express through your website. And so we're gonna kind of be diving into how exactly you guys can create these kind of animations just purely through CSS. And so kind of just to break it down into like the very like simplest terms of like what an animation is, it's basically just a change of state over time. Um, so 
two questions that we usually ask ourselves when we're trying to design like CSS animations is, what is our starting state and what is our ending state? Because um, commonly when you see like animations happen on websites, it's usually like something triggers it to start and then there's usually like an ending state that it reaches um, or it might just like alternate in between like infinitely. And so when we're trying to design animations, we have to think about like, what is our start state and what is our end state? Um, and in addition to that, when we try to develop it into a more like advanced animation, we will also think about like, what are the middle intermediate steps as well? And so I mentioned like you are going to be learning how to do this in CSS, but there's also a lot of other ways to do animations. Um, I've used like JavaScript to do animations in the past as well. Um, but I think just for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to be focusing on how to um, design animations just through CSS. And honestly, most of the animations that you will need to like implement can be done just through CSS. So I think it should be um, enough for now. Yeah, but we're gonna kind of just go into like how exactly you can do it with just CSS. Um, so basically every single animation that you have in CSS is defined by the keyframes keyword. Um, so here you can see that there's basically at keyframes and then name and then brackets, similar to every other like CSS um, block that you'd have in your code. You have like the name um, or like the ID, the, the class that you're trying to like select. And then you have like the CSS like style rules that you want to apply to that specific element. And so kind of, kind of like in a similar logic, like you have keyframes um, and then you specify the name of the animation. Um, and then within the brackets, you specify the rules. And so basically the rules is what exactly the animation is doing. Um, and we'll be defining basically like keyframes name rules is like the definition of the animation. Um, so we'll be going into more about like the application side of how you'd use animations, but let's just kind of like, I guess, focus on like the definition part. So when you're writing out rules, usually you specify um, I guess like the start and end states in two different ways. One of them is using the from and to states. So here you can see that we define like at keyframes and then fade in. And so fade in is like the name of our animation. And then within the brackets, we have our rules. And so our rules here, we're using the from and to start and end states. So here we're specifying that from the from state, which is like the start state, is gonna have an opacity of zero. So whatever you're applying this keyframe animation to, it's gonna have a start state of opacity zero. Um, so whatever you include within like these, I guess like nested brackets is basically like what your usual like CSS styles are gonna be like. Um, so the two end state is basically just like, you know, like what you're basically reaching at the end. So like you are going from opacity zero to an opacity of one essentially. And so another way that you can kind of define rules um, in terms of like the start and end state is by specifying percentages. Um, so the percentages will go from 0%, which is like the from basically, or like the start state. And then you have, yeah, so basically when you're using percentages, um, the 0% is like the start state and then 50% is like the absolute middle state and then 100% is the end state. Um, and it doesn't have to be like 0%, 50%, and 100%. It can be like 0%, like 30%, 60%, 90%, 100%. So it doesn't even have to be like, um... oh, I just saw Aja's <laughs> comment. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't have to be like exactly perfectly divided between like each percentage you use. Like it doesn't have to be like divide by three, like 33%, whatever. Um, you can just like specify whatever percentage you want and that can just be like a state within the animation. And so here, like we're using 0% as a start state and then opacity zero is like what we start at. And then we, in the middle, go to opacity one and then at the end, we come back to opacity zero. Um, so this is just another way that you can write rules for keyframe animations. And then again, another example, um, kind of with like different styles now, so here we did like a fade in out animation, um, but here we're doing like an up and down. So instead of using opacity, we're using top. So it would start at like top 100 pixels and then it would basically move upwards because it's going from top 100 pixels to top zero pixels. 
and then it would go back down to top 100 pixels at the end. Yeah, so basically like we've used percentages, we've also used like the to and from state. Um, and as I said before, like we usually try to think of it as like you have a start and an end state, but then you can also like toggle like middle states in between. And so this is kind of like an example of like what it kind of looks like when you specify like the start and the end state. Um, as well as like a middle state. So the middle state is what you see like here in the second column. Um, and so like this animation is basically going like kind of like upwards and then downwards and then back up. And so like that's one way you can kind of like specify like the middle states um, that are happening. Um, and you don't have to worry like too much about like what's happening in between, like in between the start and the middle and the middle and the end. It usually like happens very smoothly and so like depending on like what exactly you want to achieve with your animation, like it's enough to just have like three or like even two states sometimes. And so we kind of just like went over the definition of like the CSS animations, like we did keyframes and then we set the name and then the rules within the brackets, um, but that's only like half of it. So we only defined like what the animation is. We haven't really specified like how exactly we want to implement that for like specific elements on our website. And so this is kind of like the application part of like CSS animations. So how exactly do you use your keyframe? So here you can see that the definition is at the top. So we specify that this up down animation has a starting state of 0% top 100 pixels. And then it goes to 50% and then like it goes to 100% where it basically goes back down. Um, so that's kind of what you see here with like the ball. Um, it also changes color, but we, we, we won't worry, worry about that like for now, we're just worrying about like the up and down animation. Um, so that's the definition part. And so at the bottom here, you can see that this is the application. Uh, so this is where we're actually applying the keyframe to the specific element. So potato head, um, the ID potato head is basically referring to this like blue or purple ball um, that's bouncing up and down. Um, so basically we're specifying that we want to apply this up down animation to this potato head. And we basically say like animation dash name colon up down. Um, so that basically assigns this keyframe animation to this potato head element. Um, you can also specify the animation duration. So um, you can basically duration is like how long it takes for this animation to like pan out or like to play. Um, so you can specify that it's like 0 0.5 seconds, which is what you see here. Um, you can also specify like, I guess like two seconds or like an arbitrary number, whatever you want, um, but it's usually in seconds. So yeah, just to keep that in mind. So the ones that I talked about so far, animation name and animation duration, those are mandatory properties that you have to assign. Um, Cause if you don't assign animation name, you're not gonna know which animation you're applying to this potato head. And if you don't specify the animation duration, you're not gonna know like how fast or how slow you want this animation to play. So these are the mandatory properties that you want to include. Um, otherwise your animation won't work because again, like animation is basically like your start state and your end state and whatever happens in between. So if you don't specify like the duration, like you're not gonna know how, you're, you're not telling like the animation basically like how long it should take um, to like finish. There's a lot of other like optional adjustments that you can also make. Um, so here you can see that there's like animation name, animation duration, as we mentioned before. Um, and then there's also four additional properties that you can also assign to potato head. One of them is called animation timing function. Um, and so that's basically like the speed curve. Um, so basically there's a lot of different values you can assign to animation timing function. Um, I believe you can do like linear, which means that like the animation is like even across all of the different states. So like it will occur at the same linear speed across all of the like states from like the start to the end. Um, but if you do ease in, I believe that means that you start out super slow and then you like accelerate. Um, whereas ease out is kind of the opposite. So you, you end slower than you begin. So you start out fast and then you end slow. And so that's kind of like, how the speed curve essentially works for animations. It dictates how fast the animation takes at certain like states um, throughout the animation. 
The second, I guess, property you can also use is delay. Um, so animation delay, it basically specifies like how long you want the animation to wait until it actually begins. So here, like we specified, um, we want the animation delay to be zero seconds, which I believe is the default. So you want it to start as soon as possible, um, like right when your like DOM content loads on your page. Uh, you can also specify, um, like for example, if you wanna make it like two seconds after the page loads, then the animation won't actually start until like two seconds later. Uh, so this, you know, it also like depends on like what you're trying to like, I guess, do with your animation, but there's a lot of different ways you can like play around with like the timings of how your animations play out. Um, another thing you can use is animation iteration count. And so this, you can think of it as like the play number. Um, so it's like how many times you want it to play. Um, so here we specify we, we want it to play for two times. So you'll see it go from the start to the end state and then from the start to the end state, like again, so it'll do it twice. Um, a common, I guess, like value that people assign for iteration count is infinite. So that means that it will just keep doing it like forever. Like as long as like your page is open, like it will just keep going from the start to the end state and then back to start and then to the end state again. And so it would just do it infinitely amount of, infinite amount of times. And then the last one is animation direction. And so this is kind of like, like so far we assume that everything happens from like start to end state, from, like from the from state to the to state or like the 0% state to the 100% state. The animation direction is kind of like helping you um, like specify like where you, which state you want to start at. So if you want to say, you want to start at the end state instead of the uh, start state, you can say reverse. And so it would do like, like the end state and then basically go backwards um, to the like from state. Um, and so like if you have zero, 50%, 100%, it'll start at the 100% state and then go all the way back to like the 0% state. Yeah, so kind of like a more like information about like the easing functions or like the speed um, the speed curve that we were talking about earlier. So you can click on this website. Um, it will basically like show you all of these different like um, kinds of like speed curves that you could use um, for like the animation timing function. So basically like when the slope is, uh, I guess like more intense or like more vertical, that means it's like faster. Um, so you can like, I guess, click on this link and see like how exactly those different easing in like functions work. Um, but I think like, it's usually like pretty subtle, like when like it's faster and when it's slower, but this just like gives you more, I guess, flexibility with what you want to specify for your like speed curve. Oh, I guess like I kind of just went over all of these, um, but yeah, so delay, you can specify um, like when you want it to start essentially. And yeah, I think, yeah, people are asking in the comments about like the iteration count default value. So um, how we said it's one. So basically it'll just do it once and it won't repeat. So if you wanted to do like infinite, um, you have to like specify that the animation iteration count is infinite. Yeah. Okay, so you've seen like basically all of those different like properties. Um, there's actually an easier way for you to specify all of them like in one line. And so this kind of makes it a lot easier like, or I guess makes your code more condensed. Um, so there's like an animation shorthand way of writing all of these like, I guess, properties. Um, and it's basically in this exact order of name, duration, speed curve, delay, play number and direction. So here you can see the name of the animation is up down and then it takes 0 0.5 seconds to play out. And then it uses the ease in speed curve. It's basically not delayed at all because it starts at zero seconds. Um, it, basically plays for two times and then it does it like backwards, like reverse. Um, so this is just like an easier way for like you to kind of write all of the properties in a very like condensed, like one liner. And there's another property you can use um, to kind of stop the animation in a specific final state. Um, and it's called animation fill mode. And so basically what happens is usually when you specify like a from and to like start and end state or like 0% to 100% state, um, if you like basically don't say it's like infinitely repeating, it will go from the start state to the end state and it will just go, it would like reverse back to like the start state. And a lot of times you don't really want that to happen. You want it to stay in the end state. And so this property allows you to kind of 
dictate that. So when you specify you, or like when you say forwards, that means you wanted to go from the start state to the end state and stay at the end state instead of going back to like the start state. Yeah, so kind of just like defining like the differences between what you've seen before with like transitions and pseudo selectors versus what you guys just learned um, for animations and keyframes. Um, so like in the past, like you've used like hover, for example, or you might have used like focus. So those are all like pseudo selectors and you usually use them by saying like colon and then like appended to the end of like whatever element you're trying to apply it to. Um, so that's kind of like different um, because like transitions um, using pseudo selectors, that's usually when you're responding to a user's action. So like if a person's cursor goes over like the div, then the rules will like apply. Um, and so like, it's a little different from like animations because like for animations, you don't have to have that user input in order to like start the animation. Um, but also with like transitions and pseudo selectors, you can customize like the time and speed curve and like all of those different states, um, similar to like what you can do in animations. All you have to do is just use the transition property. Um, and so like, there's a lot of different resources online you can look at um, to figure out how to do that as well. But it's basically kind of like in a similar logic, like you specify the duration, you specify like the speed curve, like ease in, ease out, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's kind of just like a background on like how you might want to like simulate the same kind of like animations um, with like transitions and pseudo selectors. And so, yeah, basically to summarize like what we've learned so far about animations and keyframes, um, it does not depend on the user state and it gives you a little more control over like how the animation plays out um, as you saw like through all of those different properties that you can use. Um, so yeah, kind of just like in a very like shorthand form, like you have the definition right here, like keyframe name rules, and then you have like the application. Yeah, so always like try to remember that like for keyframe animations, it's always like you have to define the animation first and then you have to like apply it, yeah. And so that's kind of like the overview of how CSS animations work. Um, and now we'll kind of go into like a keyframe demo so that you guys can try and implement it yourself. Um, or I can just like show you and you guys can watch. So let me go to this link. Actually, I already have it open. Yeah. So basically what we want to do is, oh, by the way, are there any questions so far about what I've kind of like talked about before I go into this demo. Okay, there doesn't seem to, any, seem to be any questions, so I'll just move on. Um, yeah, so for this demo, basically what we wanna do is make this pumpkin like bounce like up and down. And so here at the top, um, these are kind of the instructions that we have to implement or like follow. So first we wanna make a keyframe for bouncing the pumpkin by translating its Y value from negative 200 pixels um, to 30 pixels. So basically like negative 200 pixels means it's like above. So like right here, like right now you can see that like it's kind of floating in the air, but you want it to like go down to like 30 pixels. Um, so that's the first animation that we have to implement. And then the second animation is um, the shadow. So like when the pumpkin goes down and like touches the ground, the shadow should basically increasingly gets smaller as the pumpkin is like getting closer to the ground. Um, so that's the second animation that we have to kind of implement. Um, someone asked, what is the negative 230 pixels with respect to? Is it the object's current position? Uh, yeah, so actually we can look at that right now. So pumpkin, it says that it's display block width of this. Um, and it says that it basically translated it like beforehand to negative 200 pixels. So yeah, that is respect to like, I think, let me pull up the HTML. So pumpkin is within body. And so negative 200, I like, I guess just from like looking at this, like negative 200 is like at the top here. So like I would say zero is kind of like at this point. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but yeah, that's like what I would assume is zero pixels. Um, so I think it's respect to, with respect to like this point. Yeah, okay. Hopefully that answers your question. I think it'll make more sense like once you see the animation play out because you'll see it go from like negative 200 to 30 pixels. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, going back to, I guess, like the animations that we have to define. So the first one is making the pumpkin like bounce itself. And then also the second one is to make the shadow like decrease in size as it bounces down. Okay, so kind of like applying what we learned before. So we want to define like the keyframes. So you would say at keyframes and let's just say like bounce. And then you use brackets and then within this you would specify the rules. Um, so it already starts at like a negative 200 pixel state. So all you have to do is specify like the end state. Um, so you can do this like in many different ways um, as we kind of said in our lecture, but I'm just gonna use the percentage method. So I'm gonna say 100% is basically top 30 pixels. And so that's um, our first definition for the animation of like bouncing a pumpkin up and down. And then the second definition we want to do is changing the size of the shadow. So I'm gonna call this shadow. And so you want it to scale to half its size when the pumpkin is farthest to the ground and vice versa. Okay. So basically when it gets closer to the ground, it should become smaller. Um, actually, let me, just so I don't like mess this up. <laughs> Okay. Wait, can you guys see just like this screen right now? Like the one I was on before. Okay. Yeah, so basically for um, the second definition, so you wanted to basically transform or like scale down um, like 50%. So I'm basically gonna use like the same method I did before with 100%. Um, and I'm gonna say transform scale. And I believe scale is like a numerical value like out of one. So if you wanted to scale by 50%, you would say 0 0.5. And actually let me modify the previous one I did because I think this is not um, completely correct. So instead of saying like top, because they use like transform translate y, I'm just going to keep using that because um, it'll, it'll be more consistent. So I'll say that it translates y of 30 pixels. Yeah. Okay. And so we kind of defined um, how would we figure out the y values in our websites? Yeah. So usually, like, you know, like, the, Zero, zero is like the top left coordinate of your website. And so like anything that you like position relative to, relative to that, like you know what like zero, zero is and you know like what, for example, like 200 pixels is. Um, here, like for this example, like because we're just doing like a pumpkin, like negative 200 is just like this position and then like zero is just like, I guess like where it would originally be located, yeah. And so going back to, I guess, the animation. So we've already defined the two animation, like the keyframe animations. All we have to do now is apply them. So in order to apply them, um, as you can see here, we kind of gave you space to do that. So in order to apply kind of like what we've seen before is we have to specify the name of the animation as well as the duration. Cause those are like the mandatory properties that you have to specify. So I'm gonna do like a one-liner here so animation, um, this is the pumpkin. So we want to use bounce. And here it says that we want to have a duration of 0 0.5 seconds. So I'm gonna say 0 0.5 seconds and then ease in timing function. So that is like the speed curve that we want to use. Um, and so I'm just gonna say ease in. And then you want no delay. So I would say zero seconds. And then you want it to repeat infinitely and alternate. So all you have to do is specify infinite and alternate. Yeah. 
So those are like the keywords that um, correspond to like the repetition as well as the direction. Yeah. And so that's kind of like all you have to do to just apply like the bounce animation to the pumpkin. And then for the second one, for the shadow, similarly, we would specify the name. So we define it as shadow. And then you want the same exact properties as the pumpkin. So I'm just gonna use or copy and paste what I did previously. So it would also have a duration of 0 0.5 seconds, ease in, no delay, and infinite repeats as well as alternate. Yeah, so that's um, pretty much like the bulk of what you need to do to like define and apply the animation. Um, so let us try, I guess, running it now. Or I guess it's already running, sorry. I don't know why I like thought you had to press the button to run. But yeah, as you can see, it's working now. So the pumpkin is bouncing up and down. Um, you can see it goes from like negative 200 pixels, which is like the top area, and then it goes down to like 30 pixels. Um, someone's asking about why we use transform. Oh yeah, so I just like, I kind of like defaulted to using top just because like you usually use top, but here they use transform and translate. So I decided to use that as well, just to like stay consistent. Um, we can try top 30 and see what that looks like. So yeah, it looks kind of strange. So I think it's, um, oh, there's another question. Why did you pick easing as your function over other options? How do you pick a function? Um, I guess like I didn't really like go in depth about like the different easing functions that you can do, but um, I think on one of the slides, actually, let me just pull it up right now. So going back to the slide that I was talking about for the speed curves, where is it? So here, um, if you go to this website, it'll actually show you all of the different easing functions that you can do. So here, if you like mouse over it, it should show you kind of like the speed at which like a certain speed curve works. Um, and like when the slope is basically like more vertical, it's faster. So like here you see it goes like from slow to fast and then slow. Yeah, so I think like in terms of um, deciding like which function you wanna use, I think like it depends on like your own, it's up to your own discretion basically, unless we like specify we want you to use like the ease in function. Um, I believe the solutions, like if you look at the solutions on the last slide for the demo, they use like a different um, ease in function and it's a lot more complicated um, you don't have to do that because we only just specify like ease in, but yeah, that's like, it just gives you more flexibility with what kind of functions you want to use. Yeah, but this kind of gives you all of the different possibilities for like the easing functions. Um, what is the 100% specify again? 100%, oh, like the state. So basically 100% is like the end state. Um, so here I like purposely omitted the 0% state you don't have to specify the start state um, if you only want, if you only care about like the end state. And so here it's enough that I just need to specify the end state. And so I only said 100%. So 100% is like the end state, the start state is like the 0%. And then the middle state is like whatever percentage is in between, in between zero and 100, yeah. So again, like the way you define animations is you specify the name up here and then within these brackets, you define the rules and each of the rules are basically like the states that you want to use for the animation. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. And yeah, I think um, the confusion around like top and transform. So I think how we kind of cleared it up in the chat. Um, but basically like because we already use like translate Y here, I think it's best to use translate Y up here as well because the top will be based off like the origin point um, rather than like this point basically, yeah. So let me just change it back to transform. Yeah, so that's kind of what you should get for your final animation. Are there any other questions? Q 
can we do more than 2D animations, for example, rotate an object in 3D space? Um, good question. I've never done 3D space animations, so I can't really tell you how, but I'm pretty sure there's like a way to do it. If not, oh, okay, do the homework this week to find out, yes. Okay, yeah, you can. Oh, I was thinking like a 3D shape rotating, but yes, you can definitely rotate an object. Like you can like flip it and like rotate the angle of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say like for 3D shapes, like it's probably a little more complicated and so it might require some JavaScript as well, yeah. But for the sake of like this class, um, you guys are only going to be doing like 2D shapes um, with like rotation and flipping and like stuff that you can just do with like CSS. Yeah. If there's no other questions, I can just end it here. Sorry to interrupt the song that people just said was good. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm sorry, but okay. This week we're talking about motion, flow, and aesthetic. Um, if I sound kind of dead, it's because I randomly got a cold yesterday. Don't worry, it's not COVID. Um, yeah, I'm not feeling too great. Normally I have a demo this lecture, but uh, I'm not gonna do it this time. It's recorded on YouTube, but also it's foreshadowing for an assignment you guys haven't done yet. So that's also why I took it out. But yeah, anyway, um, thank you, Alvin. <laughs> Let's talk about motion and flow. So essentially, how do you use animation to make sites flow better? We've talked about adding in animations as kind of complementary graphics, but not as part of how the page flows um, and transitions. So this is not a real part of PayPal, but as you can see, this animation, you know, it looks kind of nice and satisfying to look at this um, at a first glance. But actually, this is bad <laughs> usability design because it takes so long for people to get the information they need. All they want to know is what the receipt actually says. So the timing of this is really slow and people actually wouldn't want to wait this long to get the information that they need. Um, it's another common mistake people make in portfolios is having slow loading graphics in different parts of their page. And that's just really annoying for people to see um, because they just want to read it quickly and figure out what you're like and what your projects are like. So make sure that your animations um, don't make it harder for people to access things. They're not supposed to be putting on a show. Uh, they're supposed to be just kind of complimenting how th things are already going and just making sure you're not giving users whiplash from using your product and jarring transitions. Um, but we also don't want it to be too slow that they get bored of sitting there waiting. Uh, I think one of the articles I have like did has like recommends amount recommended amount of time for animations. Um, but I'm not totally going to go into that because doing this kind of flow in pages is kind of difficult. <laughs> but yeah, as I was saying, the animation shouldn't be the main attraction. Um, the content should speak for itself. And um, you really don't want to distract your users with like fancy animations or else they're not actually going to know what you're actually supposed to present to them. Uh, the website isn't a piece of art. <laughs> as cool as that could be, and art is great, but like uh, websites are for 
giving people information and people actually want to get real purpose out of it. So giving them a show instead isn't what they asked for and it can be extremely annoying. So here you can see um, just some like standard navigation. This is like the default. And you can see that as you switch between pages, <coughs> um, it's pretty jarring. Like the transition is, happens super fast. Um, things don't like slide out nicely or whatever. It's just like, bam, suddenly there's new content there, um, which is fine for your midterm project, but like, it's jarring. So this is bad practice. So most websites have some kind of neat animation. Like this is a little slow, honestly, um, and like a little bit distracting, but since it's supposed to be kind of more like a magazine, um, it's kind of okay because the presentation is part of the atmosphere and the experience of going through um, this site, but yeah, you can see with all this, the flow of each part of the content is so much more dynamic and you're more interested in looking at what they have to offer and it kind of feels more like you're going through a magazine. And a lot of magazines have all these kind of overlaps of images in different ways. Sorry, I used to do magazine editing, but like <laughs> the way that they execute this is pretty well done. Um, and the link that I have there is how they them talking about like why this is good and important and how they did it. Highly recommend. So how do you prototype these animations? Uh, so in vision, if you use sketch, which is super expensive and we don't have uh, an academic license or anything for, it's kind of like Figma, but with InVision, you can use the sketch files. Um, and make interaction design. There's some interaction design in Figma as well, but it's pretty rudimentary. Envisions where you do all the fancy stuff. Um, again, not covering it in this class, but just things to look into if you're really interested. Oh my God, I, I can hear myself being dead. <laughs> There's also Adobe After Effects, which we do have for free at Berkeley with our academic licensing. Um, it's basically animations. This is how you make GIFs and everything. This is also like a cheat way um, to make animations without uh, doing the CSS coding. I'm sorry, guys, I did the C CSS lecture. But like, if you just make a GIF in Adobe After Effects, and you put it on your site, there's still an animation there. But um, It's preference really, and you can use either. Also not teaching Adobe After Effects, but it's really cool and I highly recommend you look into it. Also before I move on actually, since I have time, I'm gonna make a quick note about animation and how it works with CSS animation. Uh, one, after one of the previous lectures I had, I posted a link about how um, design tools in general don't follow how you're actually going to code those things. So like we don't have the box model in Figma or in Adobe XD or anything like that. Um, so your designs don't directly translate into code. But for animation, having keyframes is a lot closer than um, to like how actual animation is than um, than that. Like you actually go through and you add like what the endpoints are and it'll travel there. That's the same in Blender as well. And that's just something cool I wanted to add. If you want to know more about that stuff, you can talk to me about it or email me. <laughs> but yeah, let's change gears. Um, it's quite a turn actually. Let's talk about aesthetic um, and branding. So we're bringing together everything we've learned so far with also a quick crash course in branding, which is something I've become a little bit more into lately on a project that I'm working on. But um, 
basically everything that we've been talking about so far about visuals and uh, even motion now that we've covered it, you can use all of them together to create an identity for your company or for your site. And we're really getting to a point in this class where you can see the combination of like engineering and business that design is. And that's why I think it's really cool. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So what are some things that we know already? Uh, we know about color scheme, typography, how to use images and graphics and layout and now motion. If you guys can put some things in chat or just unmute yourself to say like things that I've mentioned before and how these things, uh, like different ways to use these things to contribute to how you're presenting your site and like how it gives your site personality, but please do. Okay, we got try to appeal to your audience, communicate well. Okay, but like, how do we use these things to do that? Use white space. Yes, it's not on here, but that's important. Um, visual hierarchy. Yeah, but uh, maybe I should rephrase it. How do we use the things that are on here to give personality? Not necessarily, like we've covered good design already and the things you've been talking about are part of good design. But like on top of that, how do we give personality to your site using these things? <laughs> I've been sprinkling it in the lectures so far. Animations, yeah, kinda. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna help you guys out. Have a cool color scheme. Yes. Thank you. That is correct. Uh, I think I'll just help you guys out a little bit. So having a cool color scheme. Yes. Um, basically, you want to have a cool color scheme that like using the psychology of color that we covered and maybe I'll post another lecture or another article about this that one of our TAs sent me. Um, that can help you define your brand more. So like red is the passionate color, blue is the calm color, et cetera. Like the psychology of the colors and like the pairing of colors you have can create the personality of your site. With typography, we talked about how different types of fonts can give your site different types of personality as well. So like a serif font is more classic and sophisticated and like old timey vintage kind of stuff. Whereas sans serif is more modern and sleek and technical, I guess. Yeah. And then having images and graphics that complement those things in a layout that also gives like augments the use of these things. Like they all combine together um, with motion and having nice transitions and I'll give some examples later, uh, but they all combine together to give your site personality and identity that's part of branding. So yeah, plus motion, Woo. Okay, so let's go through brand personality theory very briefly. So basically it's the idea that brands or companies um, can have personality traits like a person. And that's kind of how we think about them um, in some way. And that's how we form relationships with them. That, I, if you want the technical term, I called parasocial bonds. This is like psychology and business stuff from when I was pre Haas. Um, and also just personally interested in business. But yeah, so now that you know that, if we think about a company like a person, companies want to create a good relationship with people. 
basically it's going through and being like, how do I be friends with my users? How do they feel like they're losing something if they leave? How do they, how do I make them like me and want to hang out with me more basically? Um, and that's kind of what you want to think about too. Like, how can you be a great friend and, you know, useful colleague basically to your users? Because like, if you are a Google Drive or something that's related to being part of people's work day and work life, your, your site and your product is basically another colleague, right? So you want to be helpful and, um, usable for them too. So you want to brand yourself in that way that, hey, I'm a helpful, useful colleague and like, I'm technical, I'm sophisticated, I'm super useful. And, um, and also you want to give yourself like a unique personality too. You're like, hey, I'm different than all those other people. Like I could be your new coolest friend. And it's kind of cool to think about it in that way. Like each site that you create is like a new, individual or person in like thinking about all the things that that person would like or that fit that person in terms of like color and images and you know, like how can we express um, what our company is like and what our product is like to use and get people to think about it in a positive way. Um, and that can really help. So um, for example, with the midterm project, like what do you think of when you think of Kingpin Donuts maybe, or like, what do you want people to think of when they think of Kingpin Donuts? Like, what do you want to emphasize about them so that they feel welcomed by your site and they're like, cool, this is a place that I want to hang out when, and this is a place that I want to order from and become a regular at. Um, yeah, that's the general idea. Um, you have friends, Howie, by the way. <laughs> I just saw that in chat. Um, but yeah, another cool thing is brand equity. That's for like super big famous companies and when you have a job, but brand equity is basically like the value you get from your brand. So if you have a great branding of your site or your product, people are super, people will pay even more just because of your brand personality to use your product. and that's kind of the goal eventually. Like you want people to be that hyped about you and what you're making, um, even from like a non-money standpoint, like having people that like excited about what you made is awesome. And usually they're pretty like culturally important things that have strong brand equity. If you wanna talk more about all that science stuff, you know, ask me later, but like, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> so yeah, let's go through my examples because I understand that was kind of a lot and also like fairly technical and conceptual. So let's take a look at some cool sites. So first we're gonna look at two of my favorite sites and they're both FinTech companies. Uh, and first is Stripe. Like I know we use their examples a lot. Um, I'm gonna try to just share the web page as well. One second. Okay. So let's go to Stripe. Stripe is a financial company, as I mentioned, and as you can see, very cool site. It has this kind of like subtle motion in the background and things don't like flow into the page as I'm scrolling, but you can see already that there are these like subtle uh, little bits of motion that already give it more life um, than just a standard site. And you can see that it's kind of personalities, you know, sophisticated like ahead of its time, uh, hip with the kids, but also like hip with the important people and the adults. Um, <laughs> and yeah, actually you can drag this around and it's super cool, but design, um, yeah, design's super important to Stripe and that's something that's awesome as well. 
all of this motion is super subtle and it just gives them, you know, a welcoming feel and a light hardness, but also like we really know what we're doing, especially with this <laughs> coding animation that they have that's really cute. Um, yeah, this is a way to give personality to everything. Yeah, they redesigned. It's really great. Um, we're not going to talk about the 10 hour scream song book park. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, as you can see, they make use of motion like super well, and you can look through all their different sites and how everything moves through super smoothly. Like they have very tech intelligence and welcoming like centered brand identity. Um, so now let's look at the next one, which is Robin Hood, which is also a fintech company. But notice how it's different. Like they already have a different color scheme than Stripe. It's like this bright green that isn't often, like this darker green is seen often, but this yellow green is like not seen that often. And they kind of have an artsier vibe uh, going on that distinguishes them from Stripe. So, oh my God. <laughs> Oh, it's my voice. It's fine. Um, yeah, they also have some really nice animations and you can already see that their um, target user base is different and younger because things kind of feel more youthful. I don't know how to describe why other than like they have all sans serif fonts on the page and kind of like the cartoonist or like illustrated vibe of their site also kind of makes it more attractive to younger people. Has also the same, like, we still know our shit uh, and we're sophisticated kind of vibe from it as well. I've said vibe too many times, but you're going for a like positive vibe check basically um, when you create a site. And you can see that they also have super unique flavors of like how everything on their site is. They have similar organizations. Like you saw, they all have like the same C structure, but like just using color typography and animations and their graphics, everything is so cohesive in the same identity and it makes you want to keep using it and keep exploring it. So let's look at some other examples. So let's, I'm gonna change the order of this, but Zoom is something we all know. Whether we love it or not, that's a personal preference, but you can see that the colors are fairly muted. Um, they've got tons of resources around. They, like put the important stuff first. This is not as flashy or as smooth as the two sites that we just saw. Um, it's Z structure, it's from the layout um, lecture, yeah. Um, so you can see this is a lot flatter and kind of more businessy, definitely has an older audience because it's less flashy and sleek. It's more of like, here's the important stuff right away. We're not spending time on like convincing you or persuading you that we are popular as much. It's more of like, here's our credibility which is a different kind of popularity, I guess, but here's our credibility. Here's why you use us. Here's our function. And then let's contrast that with Discord, which has a younger audience, um, kind of more playful attitude. I love the illustrations that Discord uses everywhere in their application. They're also for calling and talking, just oh, the, the motion that they have the flow of everything. Oh, that was such a well done motion animation. It just, everything loads in so nicely. As you can see, everything is incredibly cohesive. The colors all like 
aligned together because it got the cool color scheme going on. It's just really, I love Discord. Please hire me. Um, <laughs> and yeah, now we're going to check out a different type of site because I'm trying to show you different parts of the internet. So you're not just seeing like, oh, here's just tech companies, even though we've only looked at tech companies so far because they have the best sites in general, but we're going to look at fashion magazine websites. Um, so Vogue, another like big popular company, and they close some of these tabs. Um, so you can see there's, they got some animations, they got the serif text with some sans serif, but it's mostly serif and it's very like image heavy and other than that, it's just like white, black. There's like a little bit of red because it's artsy. They want to make a statement, but you feel that they're supposed to be sophisticated, curious, also gives you like the magazine vibe from looking through all of this. And it's a very compelling flavor, I guess, of website. Then let's contrast that with L. Like they also use sans serif or serif, sorry. Um, but they have like a very different thing going on. Um, this feels more like a blog than a website to me. And even though they have actually similar content, they're directing it for different people. Because they also have image heavy stuff and it does still have a magazine vibe. But you can feel a very different feeling from all of it. It has like the bright pink instead of the dark red and things are, and they have cards instead of kind of like, I don't know how to describe it. Instead of having it as pages in a magazine, it's more of like webs, it's more full into website cards like they're not shying away from the tech aspect of it and I think that's why they have such different feelings um but yeah very different feelings from each they got like different styling and this helps them differentiate from each other you have a very different experience looking through this site than looking through Vogue like you can see the difference in it and I encourage you to go look through websites on your own uh, and see how they kind of flow and the ways in which their personality and aesthetic are different from each other and how they use the colors and images to change what audience and their targeting and like change how they're perceived by others. Um, and like maybe how they're creating that bond with their users. Um, and yeah, questions, because that was it. And I know I went through, you know, kind of rambly, but do you guys have questions? If you guys don't have questions, I guess I can't explain the 10 hour song that I have at the top. <laughs> 